aerosolized microwave clouds look like. That's what they look like. And we have the meteorological community telling us this is normal. And consider what the science community does after Fukushima. They raised the quote-unquote safe level of radiation by 10,000%. What changed? They make it up as they go, and we have an academic system that has been bought, sold, and paid for by the power structure. These clouds, as you see, are aerosolized with electrically conductive nanoparticulates that can be manipulated when exposed to radio frequencies that can cause them to repel each other. So you get an appearance, if you put iron shavings on a table with a magnet underneath, they align. And this is the same scenario we see in our clouds. So this is how they're trying to create as much cloud cover as possible, however toxic, however damaging to the atmosphere, that's their goal. This is part of how they accomplish it. These clouds are absolutely, indisputably being exposed to radio frequency transmission and they're heavy, heavily aerosolized. Well, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's there. It gets to the point where I put, put up this article and it's, it's called Extraordinary Biological Observations. And I wrote about one paragraph on it. So I didn't, I didn't want to say too much, but I had to say something. And what it was about, we'll see if we can, I'm going to try and push into those. More Jones. This is the airport. Pardon me? The art world? Microorganisms. Being sprayed in the aerosol. Um, and when we do finish today, uh, I don't have that. Uh, yeah, I want to get to it. Well, nevertheless. Uh, what happens is, I'm starting to play with cultures. I'm starting to collect these air samples, and I'm starting to create a culture dish, a medium where you try to grow things. Uh, everything I do is jerry rigged with equipment. I mean, I do it proper the best I can, but I don't have like a formal lap. I just do the best I can. But I started getting involved with culture. And I had this situation come up where, number one, I've seen these structures that look like they're an erythrocyte. And there is a twist to this, by the way. And the twist is, it appears as though the original form of these, and by the way, this is what the professional medical person concluded also at the very beginning, was that these appear to be desiccated, is the word he used, okay? Freeze-dried. These are reduced in size. These are not like you just see a blood cell just popping around. It's like some kind of core structure that is impervious to adverse environmental conditions, would be the way I would say it. But then under the proper medium and environment can be reconstituted. And that was actually his big move. He, he called me down there because he had been playing around for either weeks or months trying to see if he could. He thought that these things look like red blood cells, but he, he knew they were smaller than they should be. So he spent a great deal of time trying to see if he could come up with a reconstitution method of some kind. And he did, and that's when he called me. Uh, it was when he had a method of reconstituting them. That's when I went down there. Well, I got involved with cultures on my side. And I took these air samples, which had these uh, apparent erythrocytes, and I started forming these cultures. And I had some really dramatic and immediate growth that took place. And, like, I would have done this several times and not say a word, because this is, like, really getting out there in terms of what's going on here. Because when I put these cultures under the microscope, it's like I had a zillion cells. And not only that, they were reconstituted. Like, they were at the right size. Okay? They just weren't. And I put up this paper called Extraordinary Biological Officer, and I wrote, like, one paragraph. And it's like... Um, I don't know how to say it. No, nobody, no, nobody came after me. In fact, they, it's just that this was so important and so profound to me in terms of what's happening. Here's the problem, folks. You don't grow red blood cells in a test tube. You, you don't grow te uh, red blood cells. This is like the holy grail of biological research, is to be able to grow. I'm going to take questions afterwards. Um, to, it's like the greatest achievement of current biology would be able to create blood cells. You just don't do it by conventional science. It's not under our purview right now. 
Now, there are some leads and suggestions, right, that there are some things going on that indicate that this is a very, very active field of research and that we would love to be able to do this. But in terms of the formal literature, do you have anyone saying at all that this could be done? Well, no. And not only that, you know, Clifford Carnicum in his, you know, bedroom laboratory, <laughs> it's like bizarre. But this is what I saw, and I wrote it up, and it was so low-key, but if you look at that paper, I'm saying, this is what happened, folks. But I didn't want to make a big scene of it, but it's there if you look at it. And my point here in all of this is that, and I'm way out of sequence on the slides, but so what? Uh, the point here is that that biological entry on that list of seven, of which none of the other six are to be diminished, that biological one is gaining in terms of its repetition and dominance, and prevalence in the world. Whether I like it or not, it's happening. And it's a particular form which is sort of so far out there that you could never expect to happen that it almost doesn't matter if you tell somebody because we can't believe it anyway. But this is what starts to develop. Okay, now you have a situation where people are demonstrating a certain set of physical conditions, and you have the emergence of a term called Morgellons. Right. This is also happening slowly in the background over the years, that you have this. You have this condition where people are manifesting certain symptoms and it's starting to gather a little bit of attention in the public world, because what's happening, you know how we have this, break in logic in terms of how I was presenting the research and it's all a hoax but then underneath it's like well there's a lot of interest going on here well sort of the same kind of thing was going on with this condition that was coming up um, given the name of gallons so that you had people manifesting um, filaments in their skin okay um, uh, sores that wouldn't heal and filaments in their skin and it's like they were like physical. You could you could see them, and they would go to the doctor. And every time they went to the doctor, every time they would come out being branded as being delusional. I mean, literally on their medical records, they were being branded as being delusional. But they had physical things that you could like see. And and of course. You would take the obvious and you would analyze whether it can be a hair, right? You get rid of all the stuff to make sure nothing's going silly here. But that's all being done. And you can't, you can't dismiss this physical thing. It's not matching. It doesn't match a hair. Okay? A hair is about 60 to 100 microns thick. These things are more in the order of 15 to 20 microns or so uh, thickness. But they're being branded as delusional. And this is happening now over a period of a couple years. And it's like, it's not really making sense because now there is this pattern developing and they never get the attention that is warranted. And, and you have a mockery being made of these people. And you see suffering. I mean, real suffering from this. And so what I'm doing, and I can't do anything for a long time, I'm paying attention to it. But then there's a time, probably again another year and a half into it, whatever it takes. I wonder what the year and a half will be.